All right, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this evening's What the Health. My name is Rhiannon Adams. I am a, oh, ah, I'm getting used to this part. My name is Rhiannon Adams. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a proud supporter of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and chair of the Supporter Experience Committee. For those of you who don't know, the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society is a group or is an organization of people in all ages and stages of life who are passionate about and committed to raising excellence in women's health care and treatment. The society raises awareness and important funds for a variety of initiatives at the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. We host our Mind and Body Talks as an inclusive speaker series to engage and stay connected with our community. A big thank you to Alberta Blue Cross for their continuous support that allows us to run this informative series. I am I'm going to turn it over to Marianne to uh, to do the land acknowledgement from Alberta Blue Cross. So just a second. Hi, so I'm Marianne and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I work at Alberta Blue Cross. Um, <clears throat> so we're very excited partnering with the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society again to be bringing another season of What the Health Talks to you. I'm really looking forward to tonight's talk. Before we get started, I'd like to do the land acknowledgement. So today and every day, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional land referred to as Treaty 6 territory. We recognize that the City of Edmonton and us, the people here, are the beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the, the traditional territories of numerous West nations such as the Cree, Saltu, Blackfoot, Métis, Denny, and Nakota Sioux. We are taking this important moment here today to acknowledge that all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. And I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, now, before we dive into tonight's session, I just want to provide a quick overview of the evening and a couple of housekeeping notes. Tonight, we are honored to have guest speaker, dermatologist and medical director of Nakasui Dermatology, or Dermasurgery, sorry, um, Dr. Thomas Nakasui. Um, we're hoping that you come away from this presentation feeling educated about all the ways to understand and protect your body's biggest organ. This is a safe space for all to come to have their questions answered. If you have questions for our speaker, please um, type them into the chat, chat box anytime, um, but we will wait until the, the question and answer session or portion at the end of the session of the, um, after Dr. Nakasui's uh, presentation to get to those questions. The lecture is being recorded and will be posted to the Women's Society YouTube channel tomorrow. We are using Zoom WebView, or sorry, Zoom webinar. Um, so you will be able to see Dr. Nakasui, um, and just as you can see myself, uh, when there's, when he's speaking, um, you don't need to worry about your own video being displayed. So we hope you enjoy this experience. You are, we're also using the live transcript function. So if you want to use this, see the available transcript, there's the live transcript little button at the bottom of your screen there. Um, it says CC in a little rectangular box, please just click that and you should be able to see um, a live transcript. There is also going to be a survey that's emailed out following the lecture and we'd love you for your feedback, to hear your feedback. Uh, everyone who fills, uh, out a, um, fills out the survey will be entered into a draw to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. So without further ado, I'm excited to present our speaker, he is an award-winning double board certified dermatologist and medical director of Nakasui Derma Surgery Center. He holds a fellowship in dermatology in Canada and was accepted into the prestigious Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. We're also proud to call him a longtime supporter of our society and the Royal Alexander or Royal Alexandra Hospital campus. Please welcome Dr. Nakasui. Hello, hi, hopefully you're able to see me right now. Um, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. 
and I'm really happy to support the Lois Hole Hospital and the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. I am going to try to share my screen here in a second. So let's see if this will work. There we go. Okay, hopefully you can all see that then. Um, so today I, I'm gonna present on uh, skin cancers and skin aging. And uh, I will try to talk about these conditions. Some of them are quite common, some are uncommon, uh, but I wanna go through that with you. I thought it'd be a good topic to discuss. So let's get started here. And so I wanted to first thank again, the Lewis Hall Hospital Women's Society for inviting me to do this talk. And also want to thank Elder Blue Cross for supporting, supporting these talks. And so when uh, the Women's Society came to me and asked me to speak on something, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about, but I thought that talking about skin cancers, which is you know uh, quite a uh, big issue these days, uh, would be something to talk about, and also the precancerous type issue. So I'm just going to show you an overview of what we'll talk about. So the very first thing we're going to do is a little bit of a Quizlet, and this is something where I'm going to show you a few slides. And I'm going to ask you to try to guess whether you think it's a skin cancer, it's uh, benign, or it's a precancer. And you know, I can't see you, I can't pick on you, but uh, you can answer for yourself and just kind of keep track of what how you've done, and um, just see how things go. And maybe you'll get them all right, which would be perfect. We'll talk. I'll talk about precancerous skin lesions, and then I'll talk about skin cancers, of which squamous cell, basal cell, and melanoma are the ones that we mostly talk about. Those are the big three. And I'll talk about skin aging and some benign skin lesions. There's so many things that we could talk about, acne, eczema, uh, irritation from the mass causing, you know, perioral dermatitis, uh, psoriasis, but I thought this would be a good collection of uh, topics to talk about. So without further ado, I think we'll get started. And so first we're going to start with a little Quizlet, okay? So first spot here, this is a picture of a man's neck. And he's had this for about six months and it's located just below his ear. And you can see there's like a keratotic um, lesion just extending from the skin of his neck. So it's extending outwards like a finger almost. So my question to everybody is, do you think this is cancer? Do you think this is benign? Or do you think it's precancer? And um, yeah, you can just tell yourselves and keep track for yourself. And these, these will show up later in the, in the, in the talk. So we can show you exactly what it was. So that's the first one. Now, this is a picture of a woman who's had, uh, I'll just show you here, yeah, uh, a little nodule on the left cheek. And she's had this for about, about a year. It's never caused her any trouble, but she wanted to see um, if there's anything wrong with it. And she also has another little spot in key up here, and it looks kind of similar to the other one, a little bit different. And again, I was going to ask you whether you think these are cancerous, if you're, they're benign, or if they're precancer. Okay, so next one. This is another spot here. Uh, this is on the chest of a man, and he's had this for about, about one year as well. And it's been slowly growing in size. It bled. Uh, once, and um, yeah, he's had this. He just wants to wants to know if he should be worried about this spot. So again, try to tell yourselves, I guess, whether this is cancerous, benign, or precancerous. And the last photo I'm going to show you is this one. So this is on the scalp of a man. This is the scalp of a 70, 70 year old man, and he's had this for many years. Um, Hasn't noticed it changing too much, but he does think it has changed. It's never bled. And uh, it seems to be slowly enlarging, but not quickly, it's never bled. So again, is this cancer? Is it a benign spot or is it a precancer? Okay, so hopefully you've, you've given your best shot that, at that and, and hopefully you all get it right. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about the most maybe not the most popular, but the most common precancerous skin lesion. And so we refer to these as uh, actinic keratosis. Um, and so these are very, very common. Uh, I had probably three or four patients today that had actinic keratosis. 
And I was actually going to include a picture of a man that I saw today that had many all over his forehead and his temples and on his scalp. Uh, but it's an extremely, extremely common condition. So why do we treat these spots? Um, and so these spots, the reason why we treat them is that they can become cancer. Uh, some of these will become cancer over time. And the other reason is they, they, we, people want to treat these for it's a cosmetic appearance. They don't like how they look. So if you look on the slide here, there's one here and there's another one here. And this person actually has many more scattered over the, the face as well. And so um, you can see a little bit of scale and a little bit of roughness to the skin. And many, many people have this. And in fact, if you look around at people you know, uh, your parents, your friends, uh, your spouse, some of them probably do have some of these. So as you said, this does have malignant potential. So some of these spots can become some of these spots. And this of course is much harder to treat in this stage than it is in treating at this stage. So we like to catch them when they're in the precancerous state rather than in this cancerous state because nobody wants this on their face. If you had one of these on your face right now, you probably want it gone as soon as possible. And so we like to prevent this if possible. So what is the chance of these actinic keratoses turning into cancer? And so it's about 10%, this is the stat that I use, about one in 10 will become uh, skin cancer or progress to squamous cell carcinoma, which is the type of skin cancer over 10 years. So one in 10 over 10 years. So if you have one of these actinic keratoses today, it's not necessarily urgent because it still will be years before they can become a problem. But if you have lots of these spots, then you can probably count on some of these becoming uh, one of these at some point if you don't treat them. So it is important to address this at some point, although it's not urgent. So if you look at yourself today and say, oh my God, I've got you know uh, five of these on my face right now. Don't worry, you still got time. You got lots of time really, but you should treat them at some point and not let it progress. Okay, so nothing to worry about right away, but something you should worry about at some point and don't let it go too long. So how do you identify these things? Well, in some cases, it's actually often easier to feel than it is to see. Sometimes you can't see where they are with your naked eye, but you can feel a bit of roughness on the skin. And so uh, in this case, you, know, you can kind of see there's a little bit of scale here, a little redness might be a little bit up here as well, maybe a little bit over in this area as well. So this person does have some actinic keratoses here, but sometimes they're hard to see. Like you might not, sometimes people will point to one on their skin and I can't see it, but when I run my finger over it, I can feel it. Or sometimes if you run your finger over someone's ear, or the helix of the ear, you can feel these rough spots. And frequently these are actinic keratoses. So the scale can be slight. So in this uh, photo that you see here, there's some slight scale. And you also see other photo damage though. There's other damage. You can see all these uh, liver spots that are also on the skin. So this is a marker of sun damage over the years, potentially sunburns that he, the person has had over the years as well. So it's easy to tell sometimes when people have had a lot of sun damage. This one is someone where they have thicker scale. So this is more obviously scaly. And some of this can be even we call hyperkeratotic where it forms like a mound on the skin. So it can be even thicker than this. But this is all actinic keratosis, it's all precancer. Uh, and it's something that, like I said, could become cancer down the road, so good to treat. And this is uh, the first photo that you saw. So this was a precancerous lesion. We call this a cutaneous horn. So underneath the cutaneous horn, there can be actinic keratosis. There can be warts sometimes. Uh, there can be other things like even squamous cell can start, can look like this sometimes. But most frequently, this would be actinic keratosis underlying a cutaneous horn. So this is where the scale has started to mound up and it's become a big mound on the skin, but precancerous. The other thing that you look for is erythema, so which means redness. So in this case and in the other cases too, you could see some redness kind of underlying. You don't always see it, but here you see the scale and then you see the redness overlying it. Other things that you see in this patient, you see other actinic keratoses. These ones don't have as much redness or erythema, but there's a whole bunch of them scattered over the nose here. Uh, things that we also see that aren't related to actinic keratosis, related to sun damage, you see all these dilated veins. So you can get this from rosacea, but sun damage can also cause these dilated veins to occur on the nose. Oh, and I'll show some more actinic keratosis probably over here and over here. 
Uh, again, just an example of the erythema and the scale. Another example in dorsum of the hand, some more erythema and scale. And again, more of these liver spots, these little uh, uh, signs of photo damage over the years. And um, very, very common, especially with sunburn. This is one with a larger sort of patch of actinic keratosis. So this is all actinic keratosis all through this area. Again, erythema and scale. So where do you get these? Uh, typically it's in sun exposed areas. So uh, you'd expect this on the face, the ears, the hands, the arms, any place that's really sun exposed, the scalp, someone who's bald, for example, or balding, they can often have a lot of sun damage on the scalp. Uh, other places can happen as well. If you get a lot of sun exposure in other areas, you can expect to see it on the chest, the back. Um, there's a bunch of different areas where, where you can see this uh, and the legs as well. I'm just moving something on my chart here. Now, what are the treatment options? Luckily, there's there are a lot of treatment options. The most common one probably is liquid nitrogen. So in your family doctor's office, a lot of them will have liquid nitrogen. So you can basically freeze these. You actually cause a little frostbite on these spots to kill them. So liquid nitrogen is minus 196 degrees. You spray it on each individual spot. You basically cause those cells to die. It leaves a little blister and redness. Uh, and when those heal, then frequently a new healthy skin will grow in. So it's a really common, common treatment. Sometimes we'll more aggressively take it off by curetting them off or desiccating them or lasering them. Uh, photodynamic therapy is another therapy that's become uh, kind of, uh, quite popular. It's something we paint on a substance on the skin. And this substance, when it's exposed to light, will actually change into something that will kill the precancerous cells. So when you paint it on the skin, the precancerous cells will uptake this, this element, this uh, agent, sometimes uh, five amino levulant acid, for example. We expose it to blue light or red light, and then this will actually kill the precancerous cells. So that's another way of doing it. Aldera is another type of treatment that we use. It's a different type of treatment though in the sense that it doesn't physically destroy the, the precancer cell, but it actually uses your immune system by stimulating your immune reaction to kill these precancer cells. Uh, Effidex is another option. Uh, it works really well. It's basically uh, something called 5 fluorouracil And you again, paint it on these, these uh, precancerous spots, which take it up and it eventually kills the cells. The only problem with Effidex is that it takes a lot of treatment usually. So uh, a full regimen of Effidex typically would take about three weeks of treatment twice a day, plus another two weeks for that redness to go away. So it's about five weeks. And so it's very difficult for patients to continue doing it. We, and you know there are a lot of patients who are very motivated. Um, uh, there's a lot of people who aren't motivated. And speaking as a man, I don't have the patience to do that for so long. So uh, I'd like a more quick treatment. A lot of people would, and actually anybody would really. And so what we've been doing lately is actually combining it with Dovonix, which is a vitamin D cream that we use for psoriasis. And that combination, when you put it together, we can actually treat these actinic keratoses much more quickly. So typically we'd use a cream like this, this mixture twice a day for four days. And for a lot of people, that's sufficient to clear up a lot of these actinic keratoses. Some patients we have to extend the course. I'll tell them to use it for eight days, double the duration of therapy. And I have a lot of happy patients with this because they can use this treatment and then they can go home with it. And if they notice something new developing that they, they're pretty sure they've, you know, they've had a lot of them, uh, they can use this to clear their skin. And, and um, we have patients coming in that have looked the best they've ever looked because they're willing to do something for four days. Even I can do something twice a day for four days. Uh, and then once they do that, they, they really clean up their skin quite a bit. Um, so definitely another good treatment option. And so these are some of the common treatment options that we use for uh, actinic keratosis. So there's definitely a lot of treatments that are available. And again, there's no urgency. It's not urgent, but you should address them. Prevention. So the other way is to prevent these. How do you prevent getting these? Well, because it's so uh, strongly associated with sun exposure, the first thing is to limit your exposure. You wanna avoid the peak times in, this, in sunlight. You wanna avoid between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. as much as possible. You wanna avoid excessive time in the sun. So if you're gonna be in the sun, try to limit how much time you're out there. Um, the less exposure you have, the better. We know people, for example, who, are in, uh, who live in Australia, um, there's so much precancer and skin cancer there. I've had some patients come in and they've had 
melanoma, basal cell. And when I tell them they have basal cell, they said, oh yeah, yeah, my brother and my sister and my aunt, they've all had that. They've had like three or four, all of them. Uh, and so that amount of sun and intense sun definitely increases your risk of these precancerous cells and skin cancer. The other thing that's important is sunscreen. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but you wanna use a broad spectrum sunscreen, SPF 30 or higher. I often recommend 50 or higher, but um, at least 30. Clothing, so UV protective clothing is helpful if you can get that. So things that are more tightly knit will block more sunlight. Things that are very loose and more mesh-like uh, doesn't really give you much protection. A wide-brimmed hat, sunglasses that block the ultraviolet light. These are all important things that will help. The other thing that's really helpful is, and I think people forget all the time, is reapplying the sunscreen. So just because you put the sunscreen on first thing in the morning doesn't mean that you're safe. You need to reapply that sunscreen every two hours if you're going to be in sunlight. And if you're hiding inside your house, you don't have to reapply, of course. Um, but if you're outside, <coughs> excuse me, then you definitely would want to reapply every two hours. So these are really good preventative measures. And I think that nowadays people are far more aware of this and we're telling our kids. And I know my wife is always telling me, she'll yelling out the door, are you wearing your sunscreen? And if I'm not, she'll make me wear it. And if I, if I am, then she'll, she'll be happy. So those are things that you can do. So I just wanted to go a little bit over UV radiation, how it causes skin cancer. So UV radiation, which is always coming, um, being, we're always being exposed to when we're outside, causes two things. Firstly, it causes carcinogenesis of the skin cells. So it actually causes damage to DNA and uh, it produces or it uh, stimulates cancer, okay? The other thing that UV radiation does, it suppresses our immune cells. So there are two things that happen when you are get hit with UV radiation. And so, the question is, how do we treat this then? So number one is prevention, which you talked a little bit about already. We also want to destroy the cancer cells when they happen. And in some cases, we want to increase your cell-mediated immunity, so, which is like what Aldera does. And so Aldera is able to stimulate our immune system to some degree, so it's able to kill some of these precancer cells and can sometimes kill some early skin cancers. So there, there, there are attempts to try to stimulate our immune system to fight these things. So that's kind of the way we approach this is prevent it, we can't prevent it, destroy the cancer cells or make allow our body to kill those cells. So there's two types of UV radiation. Um, there's UV, well, there's many types, but the ones we talk about most are UVB and UVA. And so UVB are highly active. They don't go as deep in the skin, uh, but they do cause um, sunburn, redness, and they are very uh, much implicated in carcinogenesis and uh, skin tanning. So the way I usually remember this is UVB is the burning one. So B burns. UVA is less associated with tanning and sunburn, but it goes deeper and there's way more UVA radiation than UVB. There's actually 95% UVA radiation and 5% UVB really. Um, and so this affects the basal skin and the immune cells. And this is more associated with photo aging. So UVA is aging, UVB is burning. Okay, so if you have something that protects you against burning UVB, but it doesn't protect you against UVA, well, you're still going to, uh, you know, enhance the aging that your skin receives. So you want to use something that blocks both. So this is a picture. I just wanted to show this, this is kind of a famous picture in the dermatology world anyway. Um, this is a picture of the same person. And so I'd ask you which one, in which one does the skin look worse? Is it on the... Uh, well, I guess I'm not sure which way you're looking at, but on the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen. And I'll let you look at that for a second. To me, the right side of the screen looks way worse. Although interestingly, on the left side, there is a little bit of hooding of the lids, which is I think unrelated to the sun exposure. Um, this is actually the same person, but I've just taken the photos and taken, split them in half and then uh, replicated so it looks like you, know, you get both sides of the face. So here is the original photo. So this is someone who is a retired truck driver who used to drive for many, many years in the truck. And you can see the effect of sunlight or UV radiation on the left side of his face, which is the side that received most of the light. And when I look at this, I find it very interesting. I mean, um, when you look at your windows in your house and the windows in your car, they block UVB. 
but they don't block UVA. So in the car, you don't get, <laughs> excuse me, very much burning rays, but you will get a lot of the aging rays. And then in uh, windshields of cars, those are often treated to, <laughs> excuse me, to block um, UVA. So you don't get a lot of UVA coming through the front windshield, but the side windows don't block UVA. And so you will get way more UVA from the side windows. So in this case, I think his front windshield was fine. So that's why the right side of his face, <laughs> excuse me, I got a little cough, didn't get, um, didn't get much aging, but the left side of his face got a lot of aging. So I think it's just a fascinating case. And if you're not concerned about UVA after watching this, I think you should be because it, you can see the effects it has on the collagen and the elastic tissue of that skin allows that skin to sag. So very, very interesting. So also important to know if you're lying inside your house, if you're in your house and you wanna lie down in, front, in the sun behind your windows, you aren't likely gonna burn, but you still are aging your skin. So the other question is, what is SPF? So SPF stands for the sun protection factor. And really what it is, it refers to how much protection you're getting against uh, redness or sunburn. So this is primarily the UVB. So we talked about SPF being 15 or 30 or 50 or 100. It's referring to how good this is at preventing sunburn and preventing redness from the UVB rays. But it really doesn't say much about UVA. So even if you have a SPF of 100, you could still uh, get a lot of aging from the UVA. So um, uh, it's not necessarily enough to have an SPF of uh, a really high SPF if you're not getting UVA protection. <clears throat> so that's why we talk about these broad spectrum products. So broad spectrum means that you're getting UVA and UVB protection. So the things that provide the most UVA and UV protection, UVB protection, are things like titanium, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, which are um, the physical blocks. And then also things like avobenzone, which is a, a, a chemical block, organic block. Uh, but the other ones that are out there for anti uh, sort of uh, sun protection, protect you mostly against SP, S, uh, UVB. <clears throat> and again, you wanna use SPF 30 or higher, but make sure it's SPF 30 or higher and it's broad spectrum. And then we were just briefly mentioning talking about organic versus inorganic. So um, organic are the chemicals, the chemical sunscreens, where the inorganic are titanium and zinc. And so there's two different types. So sunblock is usually what we refer to when you talk about titanium or zinc or the inorganic ones. And then sunscreen are the ones that use the organic ones. Some people, sometimes they use a combination. So how to apply the sunscreen? Okay, I think this is important to do. Number one, you want to apply it liberally. A lot of people put very small amounts and maybe I've been guilty of this in the past too because um, you don't want to put too much. Sometimes these physical blocks, the um, uh, inorganic ones, they can be quite white. And in fact, I remember once I was on a bike, a bike ride with um, my family and a bunch of other families and friends. I remember one of my friend's son uh, was asking his dad, he goes, Daddy, why is Uncle Thomas so white? <laughs> and it's because I've been using quite a bit of that sunscreen, the sunblock on my skin. So you can spread it a little thinner so it's a little less white, but they tend to be a little whiter than the sunscreen. Um, these sunscreens you do want to reapply every two hours. So don't forget to keep on reapplying, and especially if you're out there for extended periods of time. And you want to apply these sunscreens about 15 to 30 minutes prior to uh, your entrance into the sun. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm just going to grab a little water, actually, if you don't mind. So I'm just coughing a bit. I've got one right here, actually. Maybe I'll just hop on during the, the moment there and um, say already I have learned a lot of things. Um, and I'm wondering, I have I already have questions for you. So if, okay. if we don't get okay, a lot of perfect. questions in the Q&A, I think that I'll be able to take over. Okay. Yeah, and sorry, I'm you. coughing here, but. <laughs> no worries. It happens to everyone. Um, the, the picture with the driver was really um, amazing, actually. Yeah, actually, it's a really great photo. I mean, and not for the person, but just for yeah. in general showing 
the principles and how it how it happens. Absolutely. Okay, okay I will uh, hop back out and let you continue. Give it a shot here. Okay, so yeah, apply liberally, reapply, and uh, 15 to 30 minutes prior. Okay, so next thing is how safe are they? Sometimes people say they're not safe. Um, in reality, they seem to have an excellent safety profile. There's no evidence of systemic effects from these uh, sunscreens and sunblocks. Um, they actually did a study where they tried to see how much absorption there was in the skin. The absorption is, is, is basically zero or very, very minimal. However, if you're concerned, the uh, inorganic ones, the titanium or zinc, they're inert. And so those are probably the safest ones to use at this, as far as we know. So if you really are concerned about safety, probably a sunblock is best. And so in this case, um, you don't want to use organic. So in this case, no organic. I know organic is supposed to be the best, and I'm not against organic, but in this case, inorganic is best. How about in infants? So this is a little bit more difficult because the American Academy of Pediatrics says you should not use sunscreens less than six months of age. But if there's, uh, if there isn't enough adequate clothing and shade, then a minimal amount can be applied to small areas. And again, inorganic would be preferable. So the physical sunblocks. So if you were to apply it to the face or the backs of the hands or something, you can safely do that, just small amounts. Um, and if you, if you have to, and of course, if you don't have to, that would be better. You can stay out of the sun, that'd be the best. Excuse me. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this part and talk about the squamous cell cancer. So this is what the actinic keratoses become. Um, so you can see here that larger squamous cell, but you can also see a lot of these other uh, actinic keratoses. They're scattered kind of all over the skin. And this person has them all over and probably never really bothered with them because they've had them for so long. But now one of them, that, you know, that 10% um, has now become skin cancer and we have to deal with that. Uh, the other things we see here too, we see other sun damage. We see these brown spots that have formed over the years. We see these telangiectasia, these dilated blood vessels all over these areas. So a lot of other sun damage here as well. This is also a squamous cell carcinoma. So um, in this case, there's more infiltration. See this big border here that's kind of uh, thickened. And so if you feel this, it's kind of <laughs> firm actually. And then there's a crust in the center. <laughs> And sometimes we see something called a keratoacanthoma, which has kind of this crater-like center to it, and surrounding it is this uh, squamous cell cancer. So 60% of these arise from actinic keratosis. Sometimes they can occur from other things, like, like things with chronic inflammation, for example, um, but most of them arise from actinic keratosis. And again, the stat between 6 and 10% of actinic keratoses will become squamous cell over 10 years. All right, now these also do metastasize rarely. It's, it's, at, it's at three to 7%. Uh, this is in um, certain subtypes are definitely at higher risk. So ones that are more than two centimeters in diameter, ones that are poorly differentiated when they're looked at under the microscope, and then ones that are in certain locations, for example, the lip, the ear, the temple, these are more likely to spread distantly to lymph nodes and other organs, excuse me. So it is something to be aware of. These can spread. They don't commonly spread, but they do sometimes. So treatments, similar to what we talked about for actinic keratosis, uh, minus a lot of the creams. We often don't use creams for this, but you can uh, basically cure it, cure it and desiccate, which means we scrape them out and then we use electrical current to uh, destroy any leftover cells and then scrape them out again. Sometimes we use a laser, do something very similar to that. We curette and laser, excising it, especially the ones that are high risk, you definitely want to excise. There's a special type of surgery called Mohs microsurgery where <clears throat> the um, surgeon will remove what they see, take a look under the microscope and examine all the different um, edges of it to make sure that it's been removed entirely. And if there's a, an area that still has a little bit, it'll take a little bit more and they'll keep on doing that till it's gone. <clears throat> so it is a way to provide margin control so you know if the margins are clear right during the surgery. And then some, sometimes, <laughs> excuse me, radiation surgery is another way. And my apologies about the coughing. So let's talk about another skin cancer. So we'll leave that one and we'll talk about the most common skin cancer. 
So the most common skin cancer is basal cell carcinoma. And we see this very frequently. So my first question is, um, who do you think is more likely to get basal cell carcinoma? Is it this man or is it this uh, woman? And I'm pretty sure most of you will say it'll be this man. And that would be correct because of you know, years of sun exposure. Um, but people this age can get basal cell. I actually had a classmate in medical school who was 20, probably 23, maybe 24. And she had a basal cell <clears throat> right in the nasolabial fold right close to her nose. And so even young people can get basal cell, though it's not, not common, it can happen. So what do we look for, I guess? Excuse me, and this is a very good question. If you're looking for these, what, what are the features that we would look for? So one of the features we look for is telangiectasia. So you can see, and that means these broken blood vessels. You can see all these broken blood vessels here. And that's a very common finding within telangiectasia. Um, not all basal cells have this, and sometimes they can present differently in this, but it's a very, very common feature. In this case, it's, it's kind of striking because there are some telangiectasia here, but in these other parts of the skin that we see, there's nothing. It becomes way more difficult in people who have a lot of um, telangiectasia to begin with. Some people just naturally have redness of their cheeks and their forehead, or they have rosacea, for example. And those people, it's very hard to tell, is it abnormal, abnormal. In this case, it's a little simpler to see. The other thing is it can be shiny and pearly. So I don't know if you can see it in your photo, but I can see it where there's a shininess to this. It's kind of pearly. And if you shine a light at it, sometimes you can see that pearliness more easily. So that's another telltale sign of basal cell carcinoma. The next thing is a rolled border. So up on the edge here, there's a rolled border that kind of has a little raised surface to it. And that's something else that you would look for. And sometimes you can actually get a little ulceration in the middle of this too. Sorry, I thought to go forward here. Um, and also in the middle sometimes as the skin breaks down. And that's often what happens with basal cell carcinomas. They start to break down, they bleed very easily. So it doesn't take much. You could just wipe your face and it starts to bleed. And so when I hear that from one of my patients that they have a spot that bleeds easily, it makes me think about this right away. Is it possible this could be a basal cell carcinoma because they do tend to bleed very easily. And again, they're, they're related to sun exposure. So you will tend to see this in sun exposed areas. But those are the common features, you know, the telangiectasia, the red blood vessels, the shiny pearly sort of surface and uh, the rolled border. So that's kind of the typical appearance. Having said that, there are less common manifestations, so they don't always look like that. And I said, that, as I said, they can become ulcerated sometimes. It is the most common skin cancer but it almost never metastasizes. I mean, knock on wood, so far I've never had a patient who had, a, had one of these metastasized, but they can become quite big and they can penetrate deeply. So in certain areas, um, along certain planes, for example, they can start to go deeper into the skin and they're harder to eradicate. So it is important to treat these when, when, when you get them. Um, Interestingly, um, you know, we talked about sun exposure being a factor. So we know that states such as California and Hawaii, where there's a lot of sun exposure, have about two times the incidence that you would see in states in the Midwest. So we know that, uh, well, then we know we, we know this stat and we can assume that it's really from the sun exposure. And we know that in places like um, Australia, <laughs> excuse me, there is considerable um, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma as well, all from prolonged and intense sun exposure. So I'm just gonna show some examples of basal cells and some of them are more obvious, some not. This person has a little basal cell on the side of the, uh, the sidewall of the nose here. Doesn't really have the telangiectasia here, um, but it is, did end up being a little bit of a, it did end up being a basal cell carcinoma. So they don't always have to have all the features. This is another basal cell carcinoma. Um, it's uh, this redness that's there. Uh, it's, it's a, might even be more of a superficial subtype uh, basal cell carcinoma, but again, another basal cell. This one we saw a picture of earlier, and this is indeed a basal cell carcinoma. You can actually see the telangiectasia overlying it here, and then the nodule. <clears throat> this one up here, though, is not a basal cell. This is probably an angiofibroma, which is a benign thickening in the skin 
It's almost like a little ball of scar tissue almost, but um, not dangerous. But this one here is a basal cell, a nodular basal cell. And this is also a basal cell. This is one that's been left for too long, uh, left for a long time. And uh, this would definitely require a more aggressive treatment to remove this. Uh, so it's definitely got a rolled border. Um, I would say it probably is a little pearly, so Shauna lighted it and there's an ulcer right in the middle of it. So then we call it a rodent ulcer, or it's just uh, eating into that skin. <clears throat> so hopefully we don't let basal cells get to this point very often. Treatment options, uh, again, very similar to the squamous cell carcinoma. Sometimes we can try Aldera and Epidec for very, very thin um, superficial basal cells. But for a lot of the cases, we like to use more aggressive therapy. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little faster, maybe. So this is a um, melanoma. So this is the mole cancer. So this was another of the slides that we saw, and I'm just gonna go and show you some of the features that make it kind of scream out <laughs> that it could be a melanoma. So uh, of the big big three cancers, this is the one that we're most concerned about. Has the greatest potential to sp spread. So these can spread to lymph nodes, to lung, liver, brain. Uh, it's definitely one of the deadlier skin cancers. If you catch it early, uh, when it's in stage zero, stage one, uh, then it's a lot more, uh, less, lot less likely to have spread. In those cases, they, there's a higher five-year cure rate for this. So it is something that um, you do want to catch earlier if you can. If you leave it till this point, to this one, I can't remember how thick it was, but definitely was more advanced. Things that we look for, so asymmetry. So if you draw a line through it, either you know horizontally or vertically, the question is, can you fold one edge onto the other and will it look the same on both sides? So in this case, for sure not. It does not look the same if we, no matter how we cut this in half, it's never gonna look the same, uh, identical on both sides. <laughs> the border, so it does have a nice smooth border. And so you know if you put a circle or oval through there, in this case, definitely doesn't have a smooth border. Color. This one has multiple colors to it. We've got, at least in my eye, to my eye, there's the dark brown, black, there's the light brown, there's red. Um, there's many, many colors within this, this tumor. So another worrisome feature, diameter. Basically we say anything kind of over six millimeters in diameter, we start to worry more. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's a problem. For example, you had a mole that's you know two centimeters in size that you've had your whole life and never changed. Probably not a worry, but it is one of the features that we look for. So we, we call these the ABCDs, the symmetry, border, color, and diameter. The other thing that's important though is evolution. So if something hasn't changed, like let's say it's been a little asymmetric, but it's always looked asymmetric, then we don't really worry about it. If it's had two colors for you know, 30 years, but it's never changed, again, nothing to worry about. Um, again, the diameter we talked about too, it's always been large, nothing to worry about. But if it changes, that's another feature that we look for. So some people call this the ABCDEs. And the last feature is something we call the ugly duckling sign. <clears throat> so this is something where you have someone who has a lot of moles on their back, for example, but there's one that really sticks out because it's way darker or just looks way different than the others. Um, so we call that the ugly duckling sign. So that, that's another thing that we sometimes look for is one that doesn't look like the others. Okay, so I'm gonna change uh, gears now and talk a little bit about skin aging. And so various factors that contribute to skin aging. And so one is volume loss. So over time, we all lose fat, we lose bone, different things that uh, contribute to volume in our face. We see a young baby, they got a nice full face. As we age, we all start to deflate, <laughs> excuse me, deflate. And so that deflation uh, causes uh, some skin aging. It's like a tent, you know, the, the, the upper part of the face kind of holds everything up as you start to lose fat in the temples and the cheeks, uh, other parts, then everything starts to sag down. The other thing is muscle pull. So when we're young, you know, we frown, the skin basically uh, snaps back the way it was, but as we lose collagen and elastic tissue to our skin, when we start to frown, those frowns start to stay forever and they, they don't go away. So those also contribute to aging because as we age, they start to have these lines that never seem to go away. <clears throat> and so the more expressive you are, the worse you are, the more likely you are to have this problem. Sun damage we talked about, so we talked about some of the carcinogenesis, but 
Also, it can cause broken blood vessels, brown spots. <clears throat> it can cause loss of collagen and elastic tissue, which affects the skin texture. Okay, and then I call them barnacles, I mean, for lack of a better word. These are things that people develop as they age. So first we'll talk about barnacles. And so this is a seborrheic keratosis. This is one of the slides and hopefully you got this right, but if not, that's fine. Um, completely benign, no cancer potential. It's very common as we age. Some people get, are unlucky and they get, you know, tens and 10 of them, 50 of them. Some people are, are, are more lucky and they get, you know, one or two, <clears throat> but very, very common. And again, no cancer potential. potential. Another uh, seborrheic keratosis. 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 Uh, easily removed though with uh, laser ablation. <laughs> Sometimes you can also try liquid nitrogen, which is another way to try to treat them, uh, which sometimes can be effective. This is another cluster of seborrheic keratosis in the hairline. And so this person has many keratoses scattered over these uh, these areas. And again, can be easily treated. So these separate not the little barnacle that they get that people get. Again, no cancer potential. Uh, there's no um, uh, strong telangiectasia. Sometimes they can actually have a few little little blood vessels in them, but in this case, nothing striking. They often have a little dent in the center, almost like a little pore, and they're skin colored and raised around the edge. They can be yellowish in color sometimes. Again, easily removed with carbon dioxide laser ablation. <clears throat> we actually, there's a new treatment now called Cellifex Nanopulse technology. And so it's the first of its kind to use electricity actually to treat um, skin, skin lesions. And so what it does, is it breaks electricity down to billionths of a second. So it does billionths of a second pulses to these spots. And this allows it to destroy the cells of space cyberplasia and sometimes even seborrheic keratoses. And it doesn't damage the surrounding skin scaffolding. So the collagen and other tissue. So it's actually been a really good treatment for this. <clears throat> muscle pull, I'll just talk briefly. I mean, it's something again, where the muscles, if you're very expressive, when you're thinking, you might get lines like this or frowning. Um, and there's ways to relax those muscles so that you can actually lift the brows and relax this so you don't get um, these lines become uh, etched into your skin. <clears throat> Volume loss. Um, this is something where I'll just show before and after. So over time, we start to lose volume in the temple. So they start to indent a little bit. <clears throat> and that's uh, something that kind of is a sign of aging. Uh, there's less volume in this uh, under eye area. There's less volume in the nasolabial fold less volume in the chin here. And so sometimes we can replenish these areas by kind of filling those areas in the temples now are smoother, under the eyes is smoother, the nasal folds are better, and even the chin. And it just kind of helps reverse some of the natural aging process where we lose volume. Sun. <clears throat> so sun, blood vessels, uh, all these blood vessels, sometimes we'll treat this with laser just to remove some of those blood vessels. <clears throat> blood vessels in the lip, excuse me, you can get a little venous lake on the lip, it's a dilated vein. And after one treatment, we could shrink it down quite a bit. Liver spots, we have large liver spots. And so this is somewhat after a treatment with one of our lasers. Uh, and then there's the skin texture. So we showed this, you know, loss of elastin and, and collagen, uh, which contributes significantly to skin aging. Uh, <clears throat> there are methods to create new collagen and elastin, although in this particular person, I don't think there's enough collagen in the last that we could create using current techniques to restore this to look like the other side. But if you're not as bad as this, there are some ways that we can do this. We can use lasers, we can use plasma, and we can use radio frequency to improve that. And so with these, basically there's two ways to kind of do this. One is you can kind of stand at the surface of the skin so we can resurface the skin here, or we can treat underneath the skin here to stimulate some collagen elastic tissue. So with laser, for example, we can treat at the surface and sand. There's some lasers that penetrate deeper. Oh, sorry. And um, they can cause a, a, a laser induced optical breakdown spots, like little bubbles in the skin that can that uh, fill in eventually with new collagen and elastic tissue. Uh, we can do this radio, radio frequency. We can treat kind of the depth in here to stimulate collagen and elastic tissue. Plasma, really, we only can treat the surface with plasma, but this has that effect of sanding. And uh, this busy slide basically talks about laser and plasma to resurface and the different types of lasers that can be used and plasma devices can be used. So kind of running short on time. So tips, I mean, sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen. Um, if 
you want skin that looks like this, uh, if you haven't been wearing sunscreen, sunscreen all your life, uh, chances are low that your skin will look like this. So that's very, very important. Again, SPF 30, broad spectrum, apply liberally and reapply. Probably the most important thing you can do for your, your uh, skin now, but also you know, for, for uh, your kids, for people you know, protect them as much as possible, prevent the photoaging. Other things, you know, hydrate, uh, good skin care. We have a product um, that we, there's different ones that we can use, but there's ones that have contained vitamin C and vitamin E and peptides is one that we really like uh, that we use at our office here. Topical retinoid, so uh, tretinoin. So a lot of people use retinol, but tretinoin uh, and other medical retinoids are probably a stronger agent that's probably better for that. Uh, sometimes we combine it with things like hydroquinone and kojic acid to help improve the pigmentation as well. So there's a combination of creams, uh, of, uh, agents that we use together for that. <clears throat> avoiding air pollution actually can be helpful. And this includes smoking. So um, avoiding those uh, toxins can actually be helpful for your skin and prevent photo age and prevent aging. And so that's basically my talk. I think I finished reasonably uh, in time. And um, I uh, just want to say thank you for inviting me and thank you to uh, Blue Cross and the Lois Holman Society. Thank you, Dr. Naksiri. <clears throat> um, that was, as I said, sort of in the middle there, I did learn quite a bit. Um, and so I am going to just facilitate the question and answer portion now. There have been some questions <clears throat> that have been asked uh, in the Q&A box. So I'm going to pull those up on my screen. Um, and then go through them. I think we did talk a bit about um, this, the, which one's the better option uh, to choose between a sunscreen versus sunblock, organic mm -hmm. versus inorganic. And I know that you did speak about that, but let's just maybe go back and if you can cover yeah. it again. I think both are fine. There's nothing wrong with using a sunscreen. Uh, I think that um, as long as you get broad spectrum protection, uh, that's probably the most important factor there. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you're worried about safety, then I think the uh, inorganic or physical sunscreens are probably the safest. But I have no trouble using a sunscreen that uh, got, you know, uh, organic uh, protectants in it. I think it's, it's safe to use. Okay. The next question um, is about radiation from screens. Um, and or fluorescent light bulbs, halogen lights, et cetera. Are any of these UV emitting? You know, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember actually, that's something I did look at many years ago when I was a resident, but I can't remember the answer to that question. I think there is some radiation beyond just the visible light. So you probably will get some UV radiation. Uh, how intense it is, I don't know. Uh, there's probably an expert out there that knows the answer to that, but. There, there is, I think, some radiation that is that's come off that, but nothing. I don't think anything really significant. But if you're extremely photosensitive, then yeah, you can be affected by, I think, by those those sources of light. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, is there an oral collagen amount that um, can help increase our loss of collagen over the years? So, is like an oral collagen <clears throat> as opposed to sort of applying it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there are a lot of people who uh, are strong believers in oral collagen. I'm not convinced yet. I don't know for sure that's effective. I mean, I, I can't say for certain 100%, but I haven't seen enough evidence to support it. Um, I wouldn't mind trying it this myself to see if there is some benefit to it. Uh, but so far, I haven't seen enough evidence to let me tell others they should be using oral collagen. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I always worry about is if you, know, if you swallow collagen, how much of that actually gets absorbed as collagen, how much gets broken down by you know, all the gastrointestinal tract and the enzymes before it actually reaches your bloodstream. And once it gets into your bloodstream, if it did as true collagen, um, how does it know to go to your skin and not to your liver or some other place? So um, it's one of those things that I'm, I'm still on the fence about. I, I can't say it doesn't work, um, but I, I would want to get more you know, um, uh, studies, uh, peer reviewed studies that actually show that it's effective. So yeah. I'm going to leave that out there for now and say I'm not sure yet. I don't want to say it doesn't work, but um, I'm not convinced 100% yet. Yeah, and I, I was wondering the same thing. Is your body, is your digestive system set up to remove collagen from the food that you're eating and deposit in different parts? No idea. But uh, 
definitely mm -hmm. an area of maybe more research. Uh, I'm going to move to, uh, we had some questions come in over social media. So uh, I have those in a separate box here. I'm just going to ask one of those. Sure. Uh, someone is saying, I'd like to start taking a uh, hair, skin, and nail mm -hmm. supplement um, and gave an example. But do you find that these types of supplements with biotin are absorbed properly and actually work? So I guess maybe similar to the collagen question. Um, well, biotin is a, a vitamin. And so mm -hmm. that I think definitely gets absorbed. Uh, so I think it, it can be helpful for skin, hair, and nails. Um, now the question is, um, it's mostly helpful for people who are deficient in that. So if you're deficient in those things, mm -hmm. taking some biotin will definitely be helpful. If you're not deficient, it may not help your nails and hair and skin that much. Uh, the good thing about biotin though, is it is water soluble. It's a water soluble vitamin. So no matter how much you take, even if you took like 100 times the recommended dose, you'll just urinate it out, no problem. So it's not dangerous for you in any way. And you can take as much biotin as you want. Um, but yeah, it's mostly helpful for people who are a little bit deficient in it. Okay, how do you, this isn't then my question, how do you find out if you're deficient? Is there like a test? Uh, I don't usually test for biotin, no, okay. but it, it is something that you, know, yeah. you can take. Fair enough. Okay. Um, someone said, uh, not ready to invest in Botox quite yet. Is there a topical treatment or a procedure that is cost or that is effective, but not as costly? Well, for Botox, the, the main benefit is that it can affect, um, the muscles. So it actually affects other things well, but muscles in particular. And mm -hmm. so the question is, is there anything that you can use topically that would stop your muscles from moving? And the answer right now is there's not really anything out there that I can you know, put on to my, anywhere on my, any muscle on my body to stop it from actually moving. Mm -hmm. There is uh, research going into topical um, neuromodulators or neurotoxins. So um, it is something that maybe might be effective down the road, but right now we don't have an effective topical neurotoxin or neuromodulator. And there's no other creams or anything right now that will stop the muscles from moving. Okay. So if you actually want to truly stop those muscles from moving, um, you really need to use Botox. Botox. Okay. Um, I've heard that diets can affect skin and breakouts. What are the worst foods consumed? I feel like this yeah. is a, I don't know if it's a trick. It's going to be tricky to answer, but it, I feel like maybe it would be. Yeah. The, the, you know, I know if I have lost potato chips, for example, I start to break out of it. So I think there are some things um, that do make things worse for people. And so if you know of some uh, food product that makes your skin worse, uh, by all means, you should avoid it. Some people say sugar, for example, for some people, it's a big problem. I think I can eat lots of sugar and not have any breakouts, but everybody's different. Um, the one that does have some proof, though, that it does have an effect on acne is dairy. So there was a study that showed that people who had higher amounts of dairy consumption tended to have worse acne. <coughs> so there is that possibility that um, dairy might be a factor. Okay. Uh, all right, let me just see how many. Okay, I have two more that came in from social media. So I'm going to finish those and then we'll hop back over because there's quite a few, um, quite sure. a few questions. Uh, so, okay, so this goes back to a Botox related question. Aside from preventing wrinkles, does Botox have other benefits? Um, I guess this person has a, has a sister who received Botox from migraines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They weren't aware that there were other, uh, I guess, uses outside of anti-age. Yeah, so um, definitely, definitely. So uh, migraines is actually one of the common sort of uses for Botox now. And so we tend to inject it where there are muscles. So we inject it in the forehead, we inject into the frown line, we inject into the temporalis muscles, just kind of just above the ear. We inject into the occipitalis muscles near the, the, the back of the head. We inject into the cervical paraspinal muscle and we inject into the trapezius muscles. Hmm. So all of those muscles, when you inject it, uh, we found to have a benefit on migraines. Um, it also may affect kind of the, from a neurological point of view, may affect um, the transmission of pain as well. So there might be other ways in which the both botulinum toxin is helping these patients. And it can be very dramatic. One of my nurses, for example, um, she had migraines, like bad migraines and that interfered with work. And we tried Botox on her, uh, actually one of my front staff. And then within days, all the migraines were gone for quite some time. So it was actually quite a marked improvement. Um, doesn't work for everybody though. So you, you might have people with migraines where it just doesn't work. So it's not effective for everybody. 
but a lot of our patients swear by it and they come like clockwork every whatever 80 12 weeks they they come back and they re-inject these muscles and they find a big improvement some people don't even have to inject everywhere they actually you know get bad headaches they don't get true migraines but they inject some of the areas of tension they have so some people have a lot of tension in their brows they're always furrowed always thinking uh, thinking at night even and they're furrowed at night and they wake up with headaches because they've had all this tension mm. so if you relax these muscles um, this is like the source if you get the source of it then the other muscles that eventually tense up don't get tense because the the trigger wasn't there and and uh, the other thing that botox is good for is hyperhidrosis so it actually stops uh, sweating <laughs> so you can actually use it to prevent sweating and you know the axilla and, and other areas the hands the feet sometimes um, and the way it works is really interesting. It, it prevents, basically it, it works on nerve fiber. So the nerves send a signal all the way to the muscle. And so when your brain says, I don't know, sweat, for example, or contract that muscle, send a signal down and, and it releases, um, these vesicles, the components of some vesicles that go across and touch the muscle fiber and, and they contract. And so what Botox does is it prevents those vesicles from, um, feeling to the outer surface and releasing. So it, it prevents that release. And so the brain doesn't even know it's not doing it. It thinks that it's do, you're doing what it's telling, it's telling you to do, but it actually doesn't. And eventually though, your body recreates um, enough of these uh, proteins. And so it, it affects the called SNAP proteins, SNAP, synaptosomal associated proteins, and it prevents the release, but eventually it creates new ones. And then now it starts to work again because the signal actually does pass on to the next stage, which is sending the, the message to your muscles or to your sweat clamp. Cool. Um, I did a, I have a, a master's degree in neuroscience, but oh. it's been a long time because I'm not, I don't do that okay. now. That mm -hmm. I just like, I remember those. Oh, perfect. So that was really cool. Um, so uh, last question from the, the online questions, is skin mm -hmm. cancer hereditary? Um, there definitely are some conditions that predispose people to skin cancer. So um, there's something called Gorlin syndrome or basal cell nevus syndrome. So they have a genetic uh, feature that makes them way more prone to basal cell carcinomas. There's a condition called xeroderma pigmentosum where they can't repair um, sort of gene, gene, pro gene problems. So they are way more prone to developing all sorts of skin cancers. And then there's uh, the familial dysplastic nevus syndrome where they have way more of these funny moles and they're more prone to um, melanoma. So there are some conditions where you definitely are more prone. <clears throat> and um, the way I used to think about it is that you, you can inherit a susceptibility uh, to skin cancer. So if your father or your mother has skin cancer, well, maybe you are a little more susceptible. And that could be partly due to your, you know, um, your heritage. Like if you're very, very light skin, your father's light skin, you're light skinned, yeah, then you might be more prone as well. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you should be wearing sunscreen. <laughs> I hope, yeah. I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah, I do. From a young age, my mother told me. Good. Good. Um, I think I rebelled as a teenager for a bit, but I do, I do wear sunscreen all of the time. Um, Good. So uh, one, okay, so LED light therapy for the face with red and near infrared wavelengths. Does it work? I'm not sure that that's, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of investigation into like infrared and, uh, and red light, and there may be some improvement. I mean, there, uh, I think that there may be an anti-inflammatory effect to, to some of that light. Uh, it's something that's not used as widely, but it is used. I mean, we often, uh, even if there's some, I know some, some of my colleagues, if there's someone who's got a lot of inflammation, they'll, they'll use some of these red lights to try to reduce that inflammation. So I think there, there is some benefit to it. Okay. Uh, and then the same person was asking about um, getting your nails done and the UV mm -hmm. light. Does it damage your skin? Should you wear sunscreen when you're sticking your hands in that UV light? Yeah. You know, I've only, since I don't do my nails, I, I've never <laughs> been exposed to that, but I'm not sure how intense that light is and how long it's not very long. I don't think that you get, get exposed to that light. So I don't think it's a huge risk. I mean, if you did wear sunscreen, you're protecting yourself better for sure. Um, I don't think the risk is that high. I'm trying to think if I've had anybody who developed, you know, skin cancer around their nail beds because of, um, you know, they've had their nails done for you. I can't think of anyone. Yeah. So I don't think the risk is that, 
that high. It's probably not long enough, not intense enough. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. But if, if you want to be 100% safe, for sure, you know, use sunscreen. Um, there were a couple of questions about the collagen supplements, but I think we've covered that. Um, what is a, a good super moisturizer, especially during our Edmonton winters? So I think hydration. What would you suggest for hydrating our skin during the winter in particular? Uh, well, there's various ones. We have um, moisturizer here called Lexel. That's very nice. Um, but in general, ones that are more greasy tend to hold water better. So if you want something that's really, really hydrating, then you want to pick one that's a greasier. Something that's really light and filmy and thin or light lotion is not going to provide you with as much moisturization as something that's a little me a little thicker okay so for some kids for example who have very very bad eczema uh, because your skin dries out so much and um, you know they want to hydrate as much as possible sometimes we tell them well you put a little bit of uh spray some water on your skin and then take you know that vaseline that you know babies use and then you basically can put that on the skin to help seal the water between your skin and the vaseline and it's very occlusive which will keep that moisture in your skin so sort of the more occlusive it is, probably the more hydrating it is. So, but not everybody can tolerate that. But if you can tolerate it, it's very hydrating. I was going to say, I, um, one of my children has some decent eczema, and I don't know that she would let me do that, but I, maybe I'll try it. Well, uh, if eczema is bad enough, she will. <laughs> well, Might. you will meet her one day, I'm sure, and we will... <laughs> Uh, so, um, so chemical or mineral sunscreen, is this the same as the organic versus inorganic question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah. chemical is the organic stuff. The mineral is the inorganic. Okay. Right. Exactly. Okay. I did learn something. Uh, what helps super itchy scalp, super itchy, scaly scalps? Hmm. Well, um, kind of depends on what the cause of that itch is, but if it's inflammation, uh, if you're getting inflammation from eczema, for example, then oftentimes a topical anti-inflammatory agent, so often a topical, a topical steroid for lotion can help reduce that itchiness. <clears throat> but some people that itch without any inflammation, but usually if there's no inflammation, there wouldn't be red. So in this case, we talked about redness. Mm -hmm. um, Hydration is a good thing to try. The problem with hydration in the scalp is, is that it can make your hair oily. So um, it's really a problem sometimes. So people that are willing to put up with oiliness, there are oils. There's like Dermasmooth oil, for example, which has a mild steroid, but it has, it's in a peanut oil base, a refined peanut oil base that hydrates the skin. And so in that case, you can get hydration and you can get the active anti-inflammatory. And so that can be helpful. The main problem with just anti-inflammatory lotions, like steroid lotions, is that they're usually they're, they, they're meant to disappear. So when you put it on and it's gone, which means it's usually alcohol-based, which is drying. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem for the scalp is it's hard to treat with a steroid lotion, um, but nobody likes the, the oil. Not nobody, but most people don't won't tolerate the oil. So it's a difficult thing to solve, but if the lotion works, fantastic. If it doesn't, you might want to try the oil. Um, and then there are other reasons. Sometimes people have itchy scalp from psoriasis. Uh, sometimes there's other conditions like seborrheic dermatitis. So it kind of depends on what the cause of the itch is. So that's okay. something that maybe seeing a, a dermatologist would be a good. Exactly. Option. Okay. Uh, this person says they, they seem to react, their facial skin um, reacts to some product in sunscreen or something in the sunscreen. They've tried mm -hmm. using sunscreens for sensitive skin, mm -hmm. hasn't found one that worked. Do you have any general information slash not medical advice, but advice? Well, sometimes you can be allergic to the chemical, right? So if the chemical sunscreen or organic sunscreen, um, you can be allergic to that. So one way to avoid that is to try to switch to the inorganic, uh, mm -hmm. potentially because those are inert. So hopefully you won't respond to those. The other problem though is sometimes you can be allergic to the um, to the uh, preservatives in it, the other, other things that are in the cream or the sunscreen or sunblock. So that case it's a lot harder because anything that has like it's liquidy, that's not oil based, like really oily, 
mm -hmm. is going to have preservative in it. So if you're allergic to preservatives, then you will have a problem with that lotion, but you'll probably have problems with other lotions as well. So other cosmetics you'll have trouble with and stuff. So, but if it's only sunscreens, I might try an organic, like a sunblock and see if that would help you. Something with no chemical components, like no um, chemical sunscreen in it. And okay. no fragrances, things like that as well. Okay. I hope that helps. Um, all right. What would little skin growths or skin tags on the eyelid be caused by? I've developed some as I've aged. And mm -hmm. maybe not just on the <clears throat> eyelids. Maybe that happens to people as they age in other places as well. Yeah. I, I get skin tags. I get rid of mine all the time because I don't like them. Mm -hmm. um, but they happen in areas of kind of rubbing, chronic sort of rubbing. So eyelids are a common place. Uh, the neck is a very common place. In the armpits, in the groin area is another, are another common places. Under the breast sometimes is another common place. Um, they're, they're very, very common. A lot of us get them. And they're nuisances. They're not dangerous, no cancer potential. Uh, but, you know, I think most people probably get a few of them. Eyelids included. And uh, they're nuisances, but not dangerous. And they can be removed easily by your dermatologist. So I'm going to jump in with my own question then. If, for example, mm -hmm. you're shaving an area that has one of mm -hmm. these skin tags and by accident you like cut it off, mm -hmm. is there a problem? Will it come back? Like, what's the deal with that? Well, you should never let should never let that happen. No, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. I mean, if it, if it came off, that's fine. Um, okay. Yeah, the problem is they often bleed quite a bit, mm -hmm. and so that can be a problem. But um, yeah, it's not an issue if you cut one off or no problem. That was an anonymous question. Clearly, um, yeah. <laughs> someone said, uh, "Thank you for a very informative presentation." What's the difference between over the counter retinol retinol? Oh my gosh. I can't retinol. See it. Yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. but with an S. Uh, and prescription retinols. There we go. I got it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the 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 prescription ones are called retinoids. They're not actually retinols. Okay. Um, the retinols are less potent, uh, and that's why the retinoids are the ones that need to be prescribed. And so, um, definitely see. Uh, more benefit from the prescription retinoids than we do from the over-the-counter retinols. And so uh, in general, anything that's called a retinol is, is not prescription grade. Okay. Is it important to apply sunscreen 12 months of the year, even when the sun <laughs> is low on the horizon from mid-October to mid-March uh, in this particular part of the world? A very good question, I think. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> I think that, you know, if you're going to be in intense sunlight, for sure, you should be wearing sunscreen. If the sun is very low on the horizon, you're not getting much, there's not much light, probably is not going to make that much difference. I hope nobody gets me in trouble for saying something like this, but I don't think it's that bad. If the intensity is not very high, you're getting a little UV light. Uh, it's probably, it's not the end of the world. And I think, I think it's okay in that situation. Uh, if you want to be as protected as possible, though, then yeah, if you then you should wear sunscreen all the time when you're outside. But if you're wearing clothing that's covering, you know, your arms and it's tight knit, you know, there's no need to put sunscreen on your arms because it's not getting any sunlight in that kind of situation, any UV radiation in that situation. Um, so I think that yours is a very good question, and I think that if their intensity is extremely low, sun's low on the horizon, you don't need to use a sunscreen personally. I notice you, so even in the sort of dead of winter, if there's, uh, if I'm out and there's a lot of snow, my freckles will, I feel like my freckles are a barometer sometimes <laughs> of the amount yes. of UV around. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I try and wear it all year round. Yeah. So. Well, if you're in intense, if the sunlight is still intense and it's reflecting mm -hmm. off the snow mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, you should be wearing sunscreen on the exposed areas, right? Okay. So all year round, if you're out like middle of the day, it's sunny probably a good choice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, does zinc or MSM help with hair re regarding growth or hair regrowth, I guess? Yeah. Not yes. Yeah. So those supplements um, are commonly used for hair regrowth. Um, I do think it helps a little bit, but I, I've never seen someone get a huge improvement from taking these zinc supplements, uh, zinc, uh, all these uh, vitamin supplements. 
Um, you can get a little bit of improvement, but you won't get, if you're expecting, oh, I'm gonna regrow all this hair, I, I don't think you're gonna see it. I haven't seen that happen. If somebody does experience that, I'm happy to find out, but I've never seen it. Okay, uh, going back to Botox, mm -hmm. um, wondering if, do you know if there's any research being done between Botox and fibromyalgia or other, other muscle issues? I'm not aware of that. No, uh, there may yeah. be, but I'm not aware of that. Um, your thoughts on making your jawline sharper. I'm not going to say this right. The, the, the stones, the stones that you put on your face, the G U A S H A G Gua Sha. I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm not even sure what that is. <laughs> Does it work? I think there's like, no one's going to hop in and help me here, but, uh, I think there's uh like these stones like maybe jade stones or something and you can sort of like use them over your face oh. and then try and smooth things out so uh, i don't know i've never heard of that actually so i couldn't comment on that i'd be okay. curious to know what the a mechanism of action would be for that i'm not sure but um i'm mr skeptical all the time so you, you know i'm gonna <laughs> so you'd have to convince me <laughs> all right um should you use uh separate eye cream for the eyes or a thick moist or is a thick moisturizer fine are fillers under the eyes for dark circles sorry can you repeat the question yeah sorry there was two things um so when's about eye cream can do you use like a separate eye cream or is a thick moisturizer all right like I'm assuming for like wrinkles um and then are fillers under the eye used for dark circles Mm -hmm. So um, the first question, um, we often use a lighter, we often recommend a lighter cream for around the eyes, but some people can tolerate very thick uh, moisturizers on their skin. So it sort of depends on the person. If you have super dry skin, you know, you could definitely use a, a thicker moisturizer on the eye area. Uh, if you have kind of oily skin, I wouldn't recommend using a very thick moisturizer there and kind of a lighter cream, cream for that. So it kind of depends on the person for that, that question. Um, for the dark circles, let me just take another drink of water. Uh, sorry. No. Um, the dark circles, there's various reasons why people get dark circles. So sometimes it's actually pigment. Um, some people have pigmentation of the skin. So no matter how you stretch or pull the skin, uh, you'll still see that pigment. So in those cases, a filler wouldn't be helpful. Some people do have um, like a shadow in that, that tear trough area under the eyes. And so if you stretch the skin, if you shine the light right at it and it disappears, then that case, a filler would be very helpful for that. And so we can actually use a filler just into this uh, infraorbital sulcus area or tear trough area. And we just kind of lift it up and it can improve dark circles. The other reason people get dark circles though, is sometimes there's a, a, um, a blood vessel, a blue blood vessel that, that, that kind of goes right along the orbital rim. And for some people, you just actually need to laser out that blue blood vessel and things will look better as well. So there's various reasons why you can get the, the dark circles. And the shadow though, sometimes, sometimes it's hard to fix. Like if you genetically have just the shape of your orbits and your eyes are such that they're set really deep back, sometimes it's, you can't really improve it very well even with fillers, although that would be the kind of the idea of what you would want to do just okay. to improve it. I think I need to come talk to you about that. <laughs> situation um what is the best treatment for rosacea oh my gosh i'm tongue twisted tonight <clears throat> rosacea well there's it depends how bad it is i mean there's various treatments out there there's some good topical treatments uh there's some called uh, a newer one called rosiver which is topical ivermectin and um for some people that can cause a bit of remission so they actually get really like a, a sustained improvement from it there's other treatments like topical antibiotics topical metronidazole gels or creams. Um, there are pills that we sometimes use for this. So oral antibiotics, um, there's um, low dose antibiotics, something called Aperlong, which is a low dose doxycycline. So it avoids a lot of the side effects of antibiotics in terms of you know, antibiotic resistance and uh, other problems, but still gives people the anti-inflammatory effect, which is helpful. Um, there's stronger things. Sometimes we'll use things like uh, uh, Accutane even, which we use for uh, you know, acne in, 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 in people. And sometimes low doses of that can be helpful. Um, there are some treatments uh, that we use that involve 
um, light, light therapy or like laser therapy sometimes is helpful. It depends on the person how bad their rosacea is and what their precise problem is. Some people get really bad rosacea where they get like enlarged noses, they get something called rhinophyma. And there we actually, we use a laser to kind of sand all that extra tissue off uh, and smooth out the nose. So it sort of depends on what the features are uh, and um, what, uh, what we want to treat. But I think that in terms of like topical, something like uh, ivermectin or rosiver is a really good treatment. Okay. Also maybe a good visit to the dermatologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Question as well. Um, I, so the person who had asked about the itchy scalp says they, um, are using a coconut oil with peppermint and rosemary essential oils to stop okay. the itch. So, um, I think that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you might want to, if you're able to use an oil, you might want to try this dermasmooth oil maybe and see if that gives you more, more benefit. Okay. Um, and then the last question we have on here, and it's basically perfect timing. Um, what... Uh, can you tell us about hair removal after or post menopause? Oh, what about hair removals post menopause? So I'm not sure if it's after menopause you you lose hair or you want to remove hair after menopause. But well, you there's, there's yeah, there's all the traditional ways of removing waxing and you know uh, all the things that people would normally do. Um, in terms of the question, might be referring to laser hair removal <laughs> because that's uh, sort of what, a lot of things that we do. Um, Laser hair removal is an option. Uh, the only problem with laser hair removal, it works best on pigmented hair. So once the hair turns gray or white, or it's really blonde hair, for example, the laser doesn't work very well. It actually uses the color of the hair as a target. And so if you don't have a target, we can't treat it. Uh, so postmenopausal, if a lot of your hair is white and some is dark, we can treat the darker hair, but the whiter hair often, well, it won't respond. Okay. Um, the last question. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to, oh, there we are. I was informed there was an additional question that I missed. So I just sure. have to continue to scroll. So sorry, um, are all dermatologist appointments covered by AHS? Or are most appointments out of pocket unless a referral from a GP is given? Oh, very good question. Sorry about that. I missed that for a second. Um, I think it depends on the dermatologist. I think most dermatologist appointments are covered. Um, I guess it would depend on, you'd have to find out about that specific dermatologist. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't charge uh, patients for consultations here. Uh, so they are covered by Alberta Health in general or you know, not covered at all, but it depends on the patient. Okay. Um, all right, so we are we are right on time to, uh, to, to finish up. We've got through that last question and I am going to do my last, I think I'm gonna do my last little thing here where I thank you, but at the same time, share my screen. Um, all right, so thank you very much. Uh, just a sincere thank you to you, Dr. Nakasui, and to everyone who joined us this evening, who took the time out of their, their evening to come and um, learn about the skin this evening. Uh, everyone who joins us really does help make this online event and community amazing. And I think we definitely learned a lot. The thing about the glass in the car, as I'm saying, had no idea. Um, but I uh, find that was just really interesting as well. Um, so if you, if those who are attending um, would like to continue to support the Women's Society, we would love for you to consider becoming an active monthly donor. So now is the perfect time because anyone who signs up today uh, to become a supporter will be entered into a draw to win this exclusive hope box that you see on your screen. Uh, so you can use your mobile device to scan this QR code uh, and that will bring you directly to the website, which is lhhwomenssociety.com. Uh, and you can sign up there or you can learn more about uh, the, the mission that we have and what we've accomplished to date and what we're trying to fund currently. A very special thank you to those who did already donate when you were doing your What the Health registration. 
uh, and to the individuals and businesses who already support monthly and continue to be active supporters of the Lowell School Hospital Women's Society, including uh, Dr. Nakasui and um, his whole family, I believe. So thank you very much. Uh, the last thing, but nef definitely not least, we wanna say a huge thank you to Alberta Blue Cross for supporting the What the Health Talks. Don't forget for those of you who are um, joining us, a feedback survey will be sent shortly. And if you fill it in, you'll be entered to win a draw for a $25 gift card courtesy of our friends at Alberta Blue Cross. The winner will be contacted directly by a representative from Alberta Blue Cross, and it is not a joke. So in the past, people have thought that they weren't serious, but you could you could win. So um, fill, fill in the survey or provide us with some feedback. We really appreciate it. Our next Mind and Body Talk will be held on October the 13th, 2022. Uh, stay tuned for more information about the speaker and topics on social media, and uh, it will probably come to you in your inbox as well. So thank you for attending. We hope to see you next time and have a wonderful evening.